Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel and welcome to another entry in our console hardware deep dive series. Today we're taking a look at the long overdue look at the GPU inside of the Xbox One. We'll be going over both the original 2013 model and the slightly refined 2016 model with the Xbox One S. But before we begin, if you're new here and you enjoy tech breakdowns like this, consider subscribing to catch my weekly uploads. And if you enjoy this video at all, make sure to hit that like button, that way YouTube will actually share this video to other people who may enjoy it as well. I really appreciate all your support. Now let's just get right into it. So let's start with a quick overview of the Xbox One's overall specs, just to set the foundation. The original 2013 Xbox One shipped with a custom AMD APU, which contains both the CPU and GPU on a single chip, which is a departure from the Xbox 360 that had its CPU and GPU separate but on the same MCM, or multi-chip module. The CPU featured 8 AMD Jaguar cores clocked at 1.75 GHz and the GPU had 12 GCN cores. The system came with 8 GB of unified DDR3 memory shared between the CPU and the GPU and operated at 68.3 GB a second of bandwidth. Now already we can just begin by talking about how the memory bandwidth is a pretty glaring bottleneck at first glance. Even though it did allow for lower latency, it was hard to compare it to the PS4's impressive 176 GB a second of GDDR. 5 memory. It was certainly a disadvantage in the memory category just by looking at these specs, but the Xbox One did have a small trick up its sleeve to make that memory delta married down as much as possible with its 32 megabytes of ES RAM, but we'll touch up on that in a moment. For now, let's break apart the Xbox One GPU specs in more detail first. This GPU again included 12 GCN compute units, each with 64 shader cores, totaling 768 shader processors. Clocked at 853 megahertz in the original model, it also included 4 48 texture mapping units, or TMUs, which are responsible for applying textures to 3D models by fetching, filtering, and mapping texture data onto geometry, giving objects their detailed visual appearance, and it also had 16 render output units, or ROPs, which take pixel data from the GPU and write it to the frame buffer, handling tasks like blending, anti-aliasing, and depth testing to produce the final image that you see on your screen. Performance-wise, this all adds up to about a pixel fill rate of 13.648 gigapixels a second and a texel fill rate of 40.944 gigapixels a second, with a total theoretical peak performance of 1.31 teraflops of compute power for the 2013 model Xbox One. Again, we'll touch on that a little bit later. One thing to note is at the beginning of the generation, Microsoft also forced 10% of this max GPU power to the Kinect, which limited its max performance initially in the generation for Xbox One, until Microsoft released an update for Xbox One developer kits in June of 2014 that included a 10% GPU boost due to removing Kinect from the total package. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the memory bandwidth of the Xbox One didn't do it any favors in the performance department, especially while also having six less compute units than its competitor at the time, the PlayStation 4. But this is where the the Xbox One GPU's ES RAM comes into play. This 32 megabyte pool of memory was more specifically called the Embedded Static Random Access Memory, and like other embedded solutions seen in past consoles, was built right on the die itself. It was Microsoft's solution to the bandwidth shortfall of DDR3, and it could hit up to 204 gigabytes a second of combined bandwidth, which is really 102 gigabytes a second for reads and another 102 gigabytes a second for writes. In practice, most developers saw between 133 and 150 gigabytes a second, really depending on the overall workload. The ES RAM wasn't also a traditional cache either. It was software managed, which means devs had to choose what exactly went into the ES RAM, such as textures, frame buffers, shadow maps, whatever was really needed. The upside was again the low latency from DDR3 and of course the embedded solution of ES RAM while still having fast access to some resources, which is definitely a better option than not having the ES RAM at all and only having the DDR3. But there was some downsides as you can imagine versus the latter being just faster memory. The first being that due to manual work needed to get full use out of the ES RAM, it obviously added a little bit more complexity than let's say just having faster overall unified memory in general like the PlayStation 4 did. But it wasn't too difficult according to developers, but there is no denying that it just required developers to do a little bit more manual work to take advantage of it. Another obvious limiting factor was the size of this ES RAM. Only 32 megabytes backed up by the much slower DDR3 and 12 compute units made hitting native 1080p resolutions pretty difficult in many cases. Outright 
right? Even if it did have faster memory and didn't have memory constraints at all, the Xbox One's 1.31 teraflops in the 2013 model admittedly put it behind even most contemporary PC GPUs for the time of its release, being referred often between the GTX 750 and GTX 750 Ti from NVIDIA, and AMD Radeon HD 7770 or R7 250X from AMD as far as PC GPU comparisons go, with the latter both also being Bannier class cards just like the Xbox One's chip. Overall, the Xbox One's GPU did struggle to reach resolution parity of PlayStation 4 or even budget PC solutions due to the lacking bandwidth and the reduction in pure brute graphical processing power to begin with. Although updates to allow more resources to be used for games did help almost a few years later into the generation, and then if we keep fast forwarding to 2016, when the Xbox One S model was released, things get a little bit more interesting. With the Xbox One S was a very subtle overclock of the GPU. Nothing major that was really advertised broadly, of course, but this model did bump its clock frequency in the GPU from the 853 megahertz in the 2013 model to 914 megahertz. That raised the pixel fill rate to 14.624 pixels a second, the texel fill rate to about 43.872 gigatexels a second, and bumped the peak floating point performance up to 1.4 teraflops. The ES RAM also benefited from this small overclock, allowing the ES RAM to hit up to 218 gigabytes a second under ideal conditions. Again, real world gains were modest, just like the usual performance the ES RAM typically saw. Now this small performance boost didn't change the game, of course, but it did help with titles that had unlocked frame rates or dynamic resolutions. You see the increase in graphics processing power, although subtle, did give some games more stable frame rates, where they struggled to hit 60 ever so slightly, and now they're suddenly hitting 60 more consistently, or just gave them higher frame rates in general. And games that use dynamic resolutions took advantage by signaling not to lower the resolution resolution quite as steep due to the extra GPU power. Now to be fair, many games also didn't see any kind of benefit at all, whether it be due to them having locked resolutions and already stable performance before this upgrade, and or especially didn't help games that were CPU bound on the console as well. Now that we diced up the Xbox's GPU and its performance capabilities, it's fun to just go ahead and compare it to the PS4 GPU. The PS4 also used the same GCN architecture, but with 18 compute units and was clocked at a slower 800 megahertz. It had 72 two TMUs and 32 ROPs and achieved an overall peak performance of 1.84 teraflops of compute power. We're talking more texture mapping units, more ROPs, and a outright 30 to 37 percent linear advantage over the Xbox One or One S, depending on the model that we're referring to, and their 1.31 and 1.4 teraflops respectively. This was definitely a pretty big jump, especially when you consider that the PS4 also used the same amount of RAM, 8 gigabytes of GDDR5, but with a 176 gigabytes per second bandwidth. This unified memory architecture that was simpler and faster for developers to use over the mixed and mostly slower combination in the Xbox One had advantages of its own on top of just having more of everything when it comes to graphical power. And often as a result, when it came down to it, PlayStation 4 games typically ran at 1080 to 900p, while the Xbox One variants of these games ran at 900 to 720p. This wasn't always the case, but it often was. And with that said, there are situations where the resolution actually worked in favor of the Xbox One by assisting with performance being a little bit better than the PS4 in the same title. This is also in part thanks to the CPU in the Xbox One being 150 megahertz faster than the CPU in the PlayStation. Assassin's Creed Unity is a good example that comes to mind. Even if this PS4 had higher resolutions, in games that were CPU bound, the Xbox One CPU and lower base resolution helped it maintain more stable and higher frame rates. And even though it often had a leg down on the PlayStation 4, I do want to also mention that any game that did properly utilize the ES RAM to the best of its ability as well as the rest of the Xbox One hardware, we're still able to produce very good looking games for the system. First party titles especially, with Rise Son of Rome being a standout that was a day one release for the system before developers really had time to fully optimize the system, and before they even had that 10% GPU increase from the June 2014 update. But regardless of these hardware limitations, compared to its competitor and PC GPUs with respectable costs at the time, I went with the Xbox One as my first console last generation, even though I wasn't a fan of Microsoft taking the all 
all-in-one, and I say this with air quotes, home entertainment system, with gaming seemingly being an afterthought. I actually didn't even get a PS4 until the PS4 Pro launched years later, but that's also when I discovered a lot of great games to add to my already great game library that I had in the Xbox One. But I want to know what you guys think of the Xbox One, and if you have any fond memories of this console, please share down below. Also, if you watch this whole video, please comment that as well too, so that way I can personally reach out to you and thank you for listening to me ramble this long and being a top supporter. Anyway, that's all I really have for you guys in today's video. This one's been pretty easy. The newer hardware and consoles, although very complex in their own right, kind of simplified how they use their hardware to achieve their goals compared to consoles of the yesteryears, which often had way more complex solutions to, to achieve the best quality gaming you can get in a console, with price and value being equally as prioritized as well. But that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.